What's up, everybody? Welcome in to another episode here, breaking down what's going on in the Brian Koberger case as his team is trying to force a change of venue based on the negative media attention, based on people's prejudgment of him about his character, about his guilt, about what he has or hasn't done in this case, based on what they say even the state agrees is some false facts and narratives put out there by the media. We get to hear some cross-examination cross from the state, some expert witness testimony from the defense, and then we get to hear the judge's thoughts at the very end of this hearing. So hit that like button, make sure you subscribe, and let's get into it. All right, so we are going to pick up the video when we get to some charts, but first let me introduce what's going on here. Right at the beginning of the video, a couple of the uh, experts for the defense have PowerPoints. The judge is like, hey, some of these are over 100 slides. They have very prejudicial stuff in them, media reports. I know it's already out there. I don't want to put it out there again. We don't want to make it worse. We don't want to poison the jury pool. A lot of people are watching. They had multiple hearings, multiple breaks in the day to deal with this. It seems like they kept most of that out while still getting in the important factors of should they change venue? And if they change venue, where can they go? And the big question is not, is there media attention? Is there negative media attention? We already all know there is. Even the state basically agrees there is. But is it prejudicial to the point where he can't get a fair trial, number one? And then number two, is there really a better county in Idaho for us to go to? That makes sense. That's possible. That's not going to be exorbitantly expensive and cost preclusive for certain victims or witnesses or certain things for the state to do. All of those are a balancing act that we're going to kind of talk through and see how the defense presents the evidence today and how the state cross-examines and pokes holes in what the defense is trying to prove that they need to change venue from Latah County to Ada County, which is um, where Daybell and Vallo both had their cases transferred to. And I'll give you my opinion at the end as to whether or not I think this is going to happen and I think they're going to change venue. And I mentioned the Vallo and Daybell case because it's been the thing that's been on the top of my mind and the biggest decision-making factor, if I had to guess how this was going to tip, that's what's really making me feel like I know which way it's going to go, but I am not confident. Um, I don't think the judge is confident at this point. Sometimes judges make decisions before they show up. I don't think Judge Judge did that in this case. So the first witness they call is James Murphy, who's the president of True Scope, True Scope which is a media monitoring and analysis service. He doesn't know much of anything about the case. He does that by design. Um, but he gets into the charts about how Latah County is specifically the worst and Ada County is better. That's the big question to me. We know this stuff is everywhere. It's in Clearwater, Florida, Tampa, Florida. It's in Australia. I got people writing me emails like Sarah Boone saying we're watching this Coburger case. I got people in Kansas telling me not as much. But these cases are big pretty much everywhere. So why are we going to create the difficulty and problem it presents to take it out of Latah County for the victims, for the witnesses, for the state, for the judge, for everybody, even for Brian Koberger himself, not necessarily his team, but why are we going to create that mess if it's really no better in Ada County? So that's one of the big focuses of this video that we're going to listen to how the experts explain the answer to that. Is there more saturation in Latah County or more saturation with media coverage in Ada County? Yes. A person in Latah County would be exposed to far more media coverage than people, a community in Ada County. Can we now switch to um, the third slide? What does this show? This adds in two additional counties that we were asked to look at. Um, it reflects media exposure specific to Bannock and Camden counties. And what, what, and we hear about these other smaller counties as well. The defense puts them into her argument because I was starting to think, like, man, the numbers kind of look better in those smaller counties, but I understand wanting the bigger county for a million reasons. The defense lays all that out in their argument that we're going to listen to later of why they picked Ada, not one of the smaller counties. And, and then there's also a gray area of rest of Idaho. You just want to explain what we see here. Sure. So if, if you look at the volume of media coverage for the same um, big range that the first two, Lata, Ada, and then four counties we're looking at, out of all the media exposure for the state of Idaho, Lata received 36%, Ada had 27%, Bannock 1.56, and Canton just over 3%. In the rest of Idaho, Okay, just under a third of the views. So outside those four counties, the rest of the counties in Idaho, for the rest of the, the, the people that rephrase that, the rest of the regions in Idaho would have been exposed to approximately 31.53 percent of the media exposure. Do you turn next to uh, I believe it's page five? Yes. 
explain what opportunities to be seen um, are and the differences in the county. Sure. So in this pie chart, again, we're looking at the same date frame. Um, opportunities to be seen um, are maybe best described relative to probability versus possibility. Each person in any of these four counties, or, or the rest of Idaho for that matter, have the, have an equal possibility to see a story. Um, it's like flipping a coin. You can flip a coin a hundred times, and the possibility of it coming up heads is equal every time. The probability of it coming up heads every time is much different. Probability is a mathematical statement, a, a quantitative measure. Um, and so opportunities to be seen are um, dependent on the media type. So, uh, And the points of these charts, which we're going to listen to another couple minutes of it, but it's more likely that you see this stuff in Latah County. We're going to find out throughout this hearing. It's more likely that it's negative in Latah County. It's more likely that you have a prejudgment of guilt. It's more likely you've heard the inadmissible or incorrect facts that even the state agrees are incorrect. If you're in Latah County, it's more likely that you're going to be connected to this case. If you're in Latah County, more connected to the university, more connected to the house, have seen the house, have walked by it, connected to all this stuff is just so much more likely in Latah County. That's what they're trying to explain. But I want to show you the charts because the state also has an argument against this. And I found that to be very interesting as well. It was a well done hearing, I thought, from both sides. I, I liked some of the arguments from both sides. We measure opportunities to be seen for, say, newspapers based on their circulation. These are paid um, subscribers who you then infer paid to receive that news, they consume that news. Um, television has Nielsen audience figures. Nielsen measures those in smaller markets quarterly and larger markets six times a year, I believe. But any of the broadcast markets we're talking about and the DNAs affecting this pie chart would be measured quarterly. Uh, so opportunities to be seen are the possibility that people in that county would see it. Um, it's the volume of those opportunities that creates the potential opportunity um, or probability that they've been exposed to X number of articles or media mentions, discrete articles, stories about this topic you have, you're having us track. The numbers reflected on the pie chart show that over half of those opportunities to be seen reside um, within Lathal County, nearly 60% or 57.03%. Uh, the opportunities to be seen per person in Ada County is 31.2%, not, not quite half, but, the, but nearly half the opportunity. And that's a simple mathematical function of all the media exposure in that county divided by the population, or in this case, potentially age eligible for jury population. And in, in terms of the, the green sliver there, Canyon County, Canyon County is close to Ada. And so if we um, assume that Canyon County residents might review Ada County news with its population of 180,000, is uh, the dilution of Latah County or the, 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 the dilution of Canyon County still significantly um, greater than the saturation in Latah County? If I understand the question correctly, how I may answer that is Canyon, and I would also say Bannock, unless you don't want me to mention Bannock, but the media exposure specific to those counties is statistically insignificant relative to the rest of Idaho, Latah County, Ada County. In fact, if you combine all those two and group them into uh, either one of those, it would change the inferences that we make on the data between Ada and Latah. Can you change to turn to the um, next slide now? Tell the court which line represents which county. And so this just shows how the numbers kind of go up and down in each county. And, and that's interesting. And I just wanted you to take a quick look at this because the state had some good cross-examination questions on it. So we're going to jump to see how the state wants to ask about the differences between the counties. Because again, does it make sense to change this venue? So let's listen to a little bit of cross. Be a mitigating factor that would decrease the amount of media coverage in this case. Uh, I can't say yes or no on that. I, I would say it depends. If those closed meetings were a public record, then the media most likely that's following this would still um, have a high probability of reporting on it. They may just not have any um, image or interviews or some of the uh, elements that go into a more engaging news work. So the coverage might be less intense? Uh, intense is a qualification that I'm not able to make. I, I can't tell you how, some, how intense something impacts you as a, as a viewer or a consumer. Sure, thank you. 
And I noticed in that chart of Latah County and Ada County coverage that in the last couple of months, those that coverage intensity in both of those counties has become pretty close again. Is that fair to say? Uh, yeah. Yes. And so, <clears throat> so Lata and Ada, multiple times throughout his charts, they get kind of close. And they testify to certain error rates. I think it's like 5%. And in the state's argument at the end, she says, Judge, they even admit there's an error rate. And these counties get so close that they are within the error rate of these surveys and these scientific tests. So does it make sense to move your staff, to move the state attorney's office, to take a detective out of a small town, to take law enforcement away for multiple days and sometimes weeks? Does that make sense? if they're basically the same. Based on these charts, it's really not beyond the realm of possibility that Ada County could again surpass Lata County in coverage, at least at certain points, correct? Again, there's an equal chance of possibility. Uh, the probability based on the data, I would say is no in my profession. I like that answer. It's like everything is possible equally, but probable, no. It's not probable. It's probable that it's going to be worse in Latah County than Ada County. It's possible it's going to be worse in Clearwater, Florida than it is in uh, Latah County, right? We don't know what's anything is possible, but what is probable, and that's what he tests, and I really like that answer. And we've already seen an uptick, and it, it appears that in, in Ada County, uh, the news is much more focused and attentive even to what I might consider a less weighted story. I think there was a story recently about a memorial garden or something that uh, this county garnered quite a bit of media exposure. But that, that's logical. Sure. <clears throat> well, in July, in June of 2024, it looks like they got so close that they were just two points apart. Is that correct? Lake County, just two points above? Yeah. And you're not willing to testify that there's a possibility that Ada County could potentially surpass Lake County in the future? I'll absolutely guarantee that possibilities are always equally available. Thank you, sir. I think it's a good question, a good point by the state, but also a really good answer by the expert. Uh, the next witness is a social psychologist who testified at the non-dissemination hearing already. Her job was to study how media could shape the minds of potential jurors. She said most people assume when someone's arrested, they're uh, like good, they got the guy, especially if they hear it from experts like cops or lawyers, even though those people can be wrong. So we're here to explain a little bit of that. My issue with this witness's testimony, which again, the state did a good job of circling back in their argument, is a lot of what she said. Let me make myself smaller so we can see the uh, slides. A lot of what she said, I feel like could be applied to every case and almost argues that no potential juror could ever be fair, throw out the jury system, let judges or prosecutors or cops make the decision, right? It's like we have to, defense attorneys don't want judges to make the decision. So we've got to find a way to get the best and most fair jury system. But a lot of what she said, I felt like could be applied to literally any jury in any case. So I don't, again, understand why Ada County would be better than Latah County with a lot of what she's saying, except when you look at the prior witnesses and all these witnesses build on each other, that there's a higher percentage, a higher probability that the people in Latah have seen this stuff and think this stuff. Once you think it, it's really hard to undo it. And I do agree with her there. But a lot of the problems she talks about stem across all jurors. I make sure, you know, I want to I convince myself maybe, but, you know, I've, I've caught the right person. And, you know, I, if I'm in that position, doesn't make me less biased, right? Like, we all have biases. All humans have biases. And so, and they also could be wrong. You know, like I said, people can get arrested for a crime and they didn't commit it. Uh, and what we found in research... Very true. Absolutely accurate. They're supposed to be presumed innocent and people don't do that. I agree with you. But that's what we have to deal with in literally every criminal case. Over many, many years, decades, is that... If somebody has any kind of indicator of authority, even if it's something as minor as height, but certainly, you know, an uh, occupational status title, uh, that people will take their words so far that they'll do things to contradict their own morals, you know, and they'll, they'll be influenced in areas beyond the person's expertise, like a doctor influencing you in your relationships or something that's totally irrelevant. And so we take it a little bit too far. Um, and in the case of Moscow and, and Lita County, it's a really small community, right? And so the authority figures are often going to be people who are known and well-trusted. And, you know, so that makes this effect even potentially more problematic. And, um, you know, as you know, Chief Fry, the chief of the police at the time, had said that he was certain that he arrested the right suspect and he didn't have any doubts. And so the community... And that's why that type of stuff is annoying. And I wish they wouldn't say they're certain. I wish, like the... Uh, U.S. attorney in the Birchmore case said, we're confident we have the right guy. Uh, we're alleging these things. We still have to prove them. We think we can prove them, but not, you know, certainty. This is it. It's over, whatever. That type of media coverage does create problems. 
And again, we're going to, we're going to take the steps of what's the difference in this case. What's the difference in Leitau versus Ada? More, more of that's coming. If you would say, okay, well, the chief of police is sure. So then I can be sure too. Uh, but like I said, you know, we can't assume and there's no trial that had taken place yet. And, and so we can't assume that that's accurate information, but we tend to take that a little bit uh, too much at face value. The example that you gave of the police chief speaking out and offering what he thinks about a case, does that, is that something that creates more bias in the minds of the Lake Talk County residents that heard that? Yeah, I mean, they're familiar with him. They know him to be an authority figure. Uh, you know, they may know him personally or trust him personally. And, and so, yeah, somebody outside of Lake Talk County, they'll still be affected by his authority status, but maybe not as much, right? And, and then he also has power over people in that community. And that seems to carry some weight when it comes to this type of influence. So similar in every case, but even worse, specifically for the pe people in Laytalk County. Uh, then she says a majority of people will be biased against Brian Koberger. Yeah, that's how it works when you're a criminal defendant. People automatically think you're guilty. Every criminal defendant has to deal with that. That's why a huge part of every voir dire, when we try criminal cases, that's what we try to hit on is, please don't sit here and think he's guilty. Don't make us prove his innocence. That's not how this process works. And that's what we talk about a lot on this show. Um, uh, but... How does it specifically relate to this case in Laytalk County? Well, there was a lot of pressure on law enforcement to keep the streets safe and the community safe so they better get him. And then she explains confirmation bias and cognitive dissonance, how um, people may think the defendant is innocent, but they're so loyal to their local community that they're conflicted. And they don't want to put an innocent guy back or to put even a maybe guilty guy back on their streets. So are they going to just say, no, you know what? We're not even going to think about that because if he even may be guilty, we got to throw him in. That's not how the law works. It's beyond a reasonable doubt, but this is how the law is and how we set up the jury system, right? It is juries, jurors from the local community, the people that live there, the people that are affected, the people whose tax, tax dollars pay for law enforcement, for state attorneys, for judges. They are the ones that sit in judgment. They are the jurors in their local community and jurisdiction. So a lot of these factors that she's bringing into me are saying like, should we just change the whole system and bring like New York city jurors here to Tampa, Florida? Should we bring Kansas juries to New York city to make those decisions? No, the point is that's not a jury of your peers. Those aren't the people that live with you or with the victims and are around this case and understand how things work in New York versus Tampa versus Kansas. You know, like we talked about in the crumbly case, a lot of guns, a lot of shooting, whatever it may be, may be very different than New York city. So that's why the system is set up. We're balancing all this stuff. And while there's some good with it being local, there's some bad with it being lo local. It's imperfect, but that's why we get to question these jurors. And that's why I hate some federal systems where the judges don't let lawyers ask questions. This is showing how important it is now you really need to. And you can't just have any random people that live locally be the jurors. But a lot of what this witness is saying, I do think could theoretically apply to just everybody. And it doesn't make sense to completely flip the system on its head, in my opinion, um, because a lot of work has gone into making it the best we can. It's not perfect, of course. Uh, then we're going to get to, let's hear her final conclusions, specifically about uh, how all of this will affect the jury pool here in Laytalk County. Even a little bit, then discussions could actually make it worse and worse over time. It could get, it could get polarized. So I don't anticipate that discussions would fix the problem. In fact, I would expect it to exacerbate the problem. And that might be why in that meta-analysis I talked about the the effect of pretrial publicity was stronger when it came to group judgments, verdicts versus individual judgments of guilt. Based on your years of teaching human bias and your extensive study of human bias, do you have an opinion about whether the extensive pretrial publicity has impacted the Laytaw County jury pool? I do. I, I think it would be it would be so hard to be a member of that community and be able to come in and be objective, man, arguably impossible. You know, so uh, we don't have a, a known method for undoing things. And the things have been done. They felt the emotions, they've seen the publicity, they've had the discussions, you know, they've been to the, the vigils. And, and uh, even if they want to be as objective as possible, and even if we disregard some of the limitations I talked about before, uh, you know, there's, we just, we, research has not uncovered a way to undo this after it's there. Uh, and so the recommended best practice by the vast majority of researchers on this topic is find people who don't have that information, you know, restrict that information in the first place, find people who don't have that information. And the same goes for the emotional experience and investment and so on. You know, utilize jurors who have less exposure, they have less reason for prejudgment, less motivation to find the defendant guilty. It doesn't affect 
them, their feelings of safety, the community. Do you really think somebody in Ada has less motivation to find him guilty? I mean, they're testifying they do. So that's what the judge is going to have to consider at the end of the day. But the state gets the opportunity to cross-examine this witness and they get into specifically what is different between Leita and the other counties. And I like that the state is focusing on that specifically. So let's take a listen to some cross. Have not been exposed. Now this is a high profile case. So we know that exposure is all over the state and the first is part of it. But if you can have less exposure, you have less uh, bias. In a case like this, where there's been so much exposure across all counties, are there unique challenges in selecting a jury that would apply anywhere? So while well, I mentioned some unique things about Lake County and emotional investment in the community, concern for community members and, you know, having felt that, that fear uh, and wanting, you know, the defendant to be guilty so that they could resolve the fear. And so, you know, there are all those emotional and social connections. And of course, Dr. Elman's report, which will come up later, shows that a lot of people uh, who live in Lake County are connected in some way to the university or the police involved in the case. So they actually, you know, know people or or they lived in Lake County. And so those kinds of things make uh, because it's such a small community, make we a unique experience. So, I mean, and so you've reviewed Dr. Edelman's uh, survey. I have. So does it sound correct that 75% of folks in Latah County are not affiliated with the university? I I don't recall his percentages. Okay. So offhand, I'd have to see the report. I could, I could look at it if you'd like. Okay. And I should be more precise. I believe the question was, are you or a family member, are you or a family member, a student or employee at the University of Idaho in Moscow? And the percentage of folks who responded, that was 75%. Does that, does that sound right? I, I couldn't okay. tell you about the answer in our number. Um, would it surprise you to find out that 60% of Lata County residents who were surveyed reported that they did not feel higher levels of stress or anxiety uh, during the hunt for the killer in this case? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what percentage I would have estimated. I just would have estimated it to be higher in Lata. Okay. So is one strategy that the court could use in any jurisdiction, whether if the trial lives or stays in Lata County or moves to Ada County, would bringing in a larger jury pool alleviate some of these concerns across any jurisdiction? Uh, well, if we're talking about Lake County, you know, a lot of the things that I mentioned were not in the survey. So, you know, there are emotions. And that is a big thing the state argues in their argument that let's just bring in more jurors, judge, even from Lake County, and that'll fix it. Because when we look at these percentages, if we bring in 1,800 jurors, 60% means 1,000 people are going to be, you know, able to be fair and impartial. Those are big numbers. It's a lot of jurors, way more than most cases. So again, I think it's a good argument. Is it going to carry the day? I don't know, but I think it's a good argument. I mentioned that weren't assessed during the survey. Impressions of Mr. Coburger that weren't in the survey. So it could be that uh, 90% of people think he's a bad guy, but they don't think he's guilty. And then that still could influence judgment. So it's really hard to to answer that question without, you know, I, I didn't make the survey. And even if I did, there'd be a lot of things that I would miss too. You know, so I, I, I can't make that determination. About uh, you said maybe if you can maybe you can restate it and I can. No, I appreciate okay. the answer. Thank you. Now, I guess the last question I'll ask you is: Would you be surprised to find out that in the survey, when jurors were asked, potential jurors who were responding to the survey were asked what their opinion is of Brian Koberger, the highest percentage of prospective jurors that were surveyed who had no opinion of Mr. Koberger were Lake County survey respondents? So that's a question. Uh, that they have no opinion about whether he is guilty. I, I think the question is just: Do you have an opinion of Mr. Koberger? Uh, um. Well, it's a high-profile case that had a lot of coverage, and the percentages are so high uh, that of people who have an opinion. I imagine I don't have those, have those in front of me, but in statistics, we call that a ceiling effect when uh, all the percentages are high. You can't really see differences. Not a, not really a great answer. She kind of danced around that answer, but I think it was a good question by the state again. Um, the next witness is Dr. Brian Edelman. We've heard from him a, a lot already in prior hearings. He's the one that was offended when they stopped him calling jurors in the state called it junk science or something or had a problem with what he did, but he takes a shot at Nancy Grace and over sensationalizing media and uh, focuses in again, what we're going to focus on listening to is comparing the different counties. So let's jump to that. If you were to move it, is there a place, where would you move it? That's the question. We're on to the second part. We're on to the second. If you were going to move counties, where would you move and how? Again, he went through all the questions he asked, the background questions. Have you heard, seen, or read anything about the case? When you ask them just yes or no questions, they always say just yes or no. When you ask them specifically about facts, you get to know a lot more information. A lot of that we already saw. He does a really good job. I mean, this survey really digs in. It's crazy the amount you can get into in high-profile cases versus normal cases. It would be so nice if we could do more of this in voir dire. We'd have a much better idea than what we normally have just like an hour or two with the jury, but nonetheless, we learn a lot from 
the way that he did it and how he compared it to other counties, which again is the focus of what we're going to talk about today. We don't need to go through his full PowerPoint presentation. Again, we did that on a prior video. If you want to see it, you can check it out on our playlist. Go ahead and hit the like button if you guys haven't already as well. But this is how we're going to compare the counties and why are they picking Ada County to make that request? That's where this comes from. So you'll see recognition rates are high in these three counties. We tested so we, we tested Ada County because it's the biggest county in the state. It's about 406,000 people over the age of 18, and other high-profile cases have been moved there before. Um, Canyon County, we picked because I believe it's the second largest county, and it is also um, near Ada County. So it's a big county. We picked that. And we picked Bannock County because it's just far away. And so and it had less media coverage. So we wanted to see if there was a possibility that people would have less case knowledge here. And you can see recognition rates vary from 90% to, uh, I'm sorry, from 84% to 93% across those three cases. And um, you can see that in terms of how closely they followed it, it's less than we saw in Lakeside County. So Ada is 58, Canyon is 51, and Bannock is 46. Compared to Lakeside County, remember, it was 68 per turn, much higher. Um, the guilt rates are essentially the same, or you know, it's a little higher in Bannock County. Um, but because of- When I was looking at these, I was like, these other counties look better. But she'll answer that in the, uh, all right, and I don't know where all this stuff is, obviously, right? I'm not from Idaho, um, but the defense explains this later. We're going to hear her argument. Population size, there's a big difference. So again, you'll, you'll find about 16 times more people in Ada County who have not prejudged compared to here. Um, and then similar in terms of the strength of opinion and um, difficulty in convincing them that he's not guilty, similar to what you see here, and sentence similar as well. So you're in the 49 to 57 percent. So numbers are also high. Where do you start to see differences that matter? You start to see differences when you talk about personal connection. That's where the big difference is. Come on. So remember we said 79% of people in um, Ada County have talked about this case. Might be wrong. Might have been higher. Um, it's just 60% in Ada County, 50% in Canyon, and 51% in Canyon. So it's much lower. Um, you'll see whether or not um, they've experienced high levels of stress. And Ada County is just 17%. And the other two counties is only 11%. It was 39% in the um, county here. And then whether or not they know someone who experienced higher levels of stress, we had 45% here. Here we got a 24, 19, and 19. So we see big differences there in terms of the community connection, the personal connection. Their case. What about um, the connections to Moscow that are unique to this area? Yes. So just 20% um, in Ada County know someone who lived in Moscow, 15% in Canyon, and 16% in Bannock, 78% in Lakeside County. Whether or not they were a student or employee in Lakeside County, that was 20, it was 25%. And we're looking at 4%, 3%, much lower. Whether they visited a home or saw it, Lake County is 40%. Here we're down to 8%, 3%, 2%, much lower. Um, whether or not they knew somebody who actually was involved in the investigation, in Lake County, that number was 22%, I believe. Um, and in Ada County, it's just four, Canyon is two, Bannock is two. So much lower when it comes to those type of connections, the personal connection, personal investment in the case. What about the recognition of media items? Yeah. So. We had, I think it was 79% in Mayda County, knew at least five of those media items, and it drops to 65% in Ada, 52% in Canyon, 59% in Bannock. Um, if they knew seven or more, that was 52% in Mayda County, it's just 42% in Ada, 27% in Canyon, and 29% in Bannock. So less case knowledge. And we know case knowledge comes back to belief perseverance, right? So the more you know, the more resistant your attitudes are to change, the more likely you are to um, attend to and process information consistent with what we know. Uh, new information about the DNA evidence, I already know about that. That's credible. I get that way. So you're much more likely to see that data coming in here. All right. Um, I think you told us a little bit about the population size. Um, and is that why you selected Ada was the population size? So I'm not selecting anything. I'm just pointing out some possibilities. Um, so I selected Ada County in terms of to do the survey because it's the largest county in, in the state. And you know, it was a demo case was moved there. So you know that they can take this case in. We know large counties, it's, it's less of a big deal when the case moves there. It doesn't become the biggest story in that community. So I wanted to test Lakeside County. Pick Canyon because it's the second largest county, over you know, 184,000 people. And then I picked Bannock because it's um, further away. It's quite far away, hundreds of miles from here, just and it's in a different media zone. Um, it does have some of the similarities of Lakeside County. So, for example, there's a university there that's the second largest employer. So there's a risk there. But 18% of the population is connected to that university. So there are those risks. Um, and I think the problem there, well, some of the numbers. Really good explanation to me about how and why they're choosing these counties. You always learn. I always learn from experts. I love learning from experts. I like the idea. It all makes sense why they pick it. Again, the defense is going to connect some of these dots again later. But you can see why and how they pick the counties that they do if they're asking for this change of venue. 
numbers are good, or um, it'll become a huge deal about cases. It's going to you're going to have the media circus move from here to there, and it's going to become again a huge story in that community. So there is risk if you choose a smaller venue that something like that. Wow. All right, we are going to jump ahead a little bit more uh, when he talks about people posting online and specifically what we can look at and learn from that. Oh, oh, I remember this, I think. Yeah, this is about um, people posting online that they found in you know different groups about somebody that they think is super guilty, glad we got him, finally can't wait for this guy to get convicted. And then when they ask them after asking the the lead up questions, it's like, well, do you think you could be fair and impartial? And like 80% of them say yes. It's wild. And I'm like, oh, this freaks me out when I try cases that, you know, it's so hard to get jurors to dig down. I don't think they're lying. It's like, I think they truly believe it, but it's hard to explain to them what truly fair and impartial means. And this is just illustrative of that. And to me, it's it's a scary proposition here to listen to this. But again, this is something we deal with in every case, even plaintiffs who file claims. People are like, oh, you're an ambulance chaser. or They just want money. It's a frivolous claim. And you start so far behind the eight ball. It's so hard to get back to just the even playing field. And this is kind of, this, this shows us that. I explain the burden of proof and that the defendant's entitled to a fair and impartial trial um, and that you can, the law requires that you set aside everything you know and only rely on the evidence, common things you hear. And all these people who express all this public bias and all this vitriol and reported that he's guilty and you can't change your mind, but just saying that to them, magically report that they can be fair and impartial. 81% said they could be fair and impartial after hearing that instruction. And they gave open-ended responses as to why. And you, so this is our person Smith who mentioned that they were overjoyed by his arrest and they were physically ill and that Robert Trish was a sociopath. Well, they, on a scale of yes, definitely, to no, definitely not, they reported that they could definitely be fair and impartial, and they reported that I could start from the beginning and listen to all the information presented and follow the directions and wipe out everything that I know. I would need to be convinced to be under so a shadow of a doubt. So that ain't the state does say in their argument as well at the end, which I keep saying was good, you can't just take all the jury instructions and everything we tell a jury and throw it out and throw it away and just assume every juror is going to be bad. We can't do that either. So we've got to have a balancing act. And I think the defense does a good job of trying to balance that. But also pointing out a lot of flaws in the system, a lot of problems in the jury system, and a lot of things that we as lawyers and as a society need to work towards making it better. How can we educate jurors more beforehand? And I really think the media is partially at fault for the negative education on the legal system. And we have to try to undo so much of that at trial, which again, is one of the points of this YouTube channel. The, the small amount of people I can get to and talk to that might end up on juries that I hope can walk in there with an open mind and legitimately be fair and impartial and think as soon as somebody's arrested, they're presumed innocent. Let's see what the evidence is. Let's see how it's, pre uh, how it's presented at trial. And even in some cases like Sandra Birchmore, which just seems so bad and it's so frustrating. And I get frustrated it took that long to make an arrest because they have enough for probable cause for an arrest. I'm not saying we should just throw that guy in prison for the rest of his life without a trial. Absolutely not. So that's hopefully what we're learning together and, and hopefully something you get out of these videos. Answer, if you see in a courtroom without knowing that this person was making public statements about the defendant being a sociopath, probably considered rehabilitated as a fair and impartial juror, which demonstrates like a person like that should be answering that question now, but they don't. Um, and even kind of going back to the, the Rideau case, which was a uh, you know, recorded confession um, in the police station with the chief of police on one side and officers on the next, played in the media with music on it. It was highly prejudicial in a small town and the Supreme Court ruled that, you know, threw out the conviction because of it. All the jurors in that case who saw that confession reported that they could be fair and impartial. They all sat on that trial. They all reported that they could be fair. And the Supreme Court didn't take that at face value because the content of the coverage was so prejudicial. All right. Based on your years of experience, your education, all of the work that you do in general, and then specifically the work that you've done in this case, the survey, the hundreds of comments. Do you have an opinion about this case and whether we can seat an impartial jury in Lake Hawk County? I do. What is your opinion? So my opinion, again, is based on whether or not there's a reasonable likelihood. So using that standard, which is less than, less than the preponderance of the evidence, Lake County is a small venue. And the crime has been seared in the community's consciousness. People have been saturated with prejudicial coverage. Many people here have direct and indirect connections to this crime. 
um, people here demonstrate there would be experienced fear and stress, panic in this community. Um, there's significant rumors and misinformation that have been spread and people have been exposed to in this community. Um, there's a feeling of pressure to, to convince, I think, given the reaction that people think a community would have if he's acquitted, that's particularly concerning. Um, we know from the data that jurors have closely followed the case, they've talked about it, they're familiar with prejudicial details. I think that the presumption of innocence has been undermined and presumption of guilt prevails in this community. Um, and I think the pre-existing attitudes and opinions will influence how people process the evidence. So even if the same information is presented at trial, there's a big difference in terms of jurors being exposed to that for the first time. I don't know about the DNA evidence. I don't know about the videos versus a juror being exposed to something that they already know, where they're just confirming what they already know. I already know about the DNA evidence. They'll hear it in the way that they have already heard it on the media, right? If they've already heard DNA is proven, it's his DNA on the sheath or whatever, they'll just assume that, yes, that's what it means. Even if the expert witness or somebody is testifying that that's not what it actually means, that's the confirmation bias stuff. It's just triggering a memory of what I already recall. And I'm processing this information through that filter that is consistent with what I believe and I already know. And it impacts how they see government witnesses and how they will view and evaluate defense witnesses. And I don't think what year is an effective remedy, given the research I've done, my experience doing jury selections, and the nature of how memory works. So taking all that combined, I think it's appropriate to, to change that. Thank you. So he thinks it's appropriate to change venue. No surprise there. And no cross-examination. They already kind of have what they need from him. The judge has already heard it. The judge can take all that into account. When the judge is the decision maker, you don't have to necessarily rehash things. You just put things on the record and in front of the judge to consider he has that. Uh, last witness is Dr. Dare. Uh, tons of work in surveys, especially in the legal field. Um, and in her opinion, Edelman survey and what was done in this case was valid and reliable. Uh, we'll listen to just kind of her summation and what her um overall opinion is it sounds like you answer the question you, you have a really okay. thorough look okay um before you had your opinion as to whether the survey was valid yes do you have an opinion about whether it was reliable yes um in terms of measurement reliability which includes things like um if you are an interviewer and you are asking questions, it could be it could be biasing if you're not trained properly. And the mode of the mode of survey that you're doing for change of venue surveys, the typical mode is RDD surveys, which is phone surveys versus paper or in person. And so the interviewers must be trained and supervised. My understanding is that research strategy has been around for 20 plus years. So I'm assuming they're like our lab where they were trained properly and they have supervision where there's supervisors also. Super I don't love her saying, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's valid and reliable. And I'm assuming this and that she's probably not wrong, but could have, could have determined that probably before testifying, I think. Supervising the interviewers. So that's another way to combat um, non-response bias, which includes refusal conversion training, which is, um, I think Dr. Edelman alluded to earlier, things like soft refusals. If someone calls up and says, I'm making dinner, I'm too busy, I'm giving my kids a bath, I'm running to the store, whatever it is. We, are, we train the interviewers on how to handle those situations so that we don't get um, only the first person that answers the phone or only those people that are saying that they're busy. So that's all part of the training to make sure that we get at non-response. Non right, I think that you have answered my questions really well. Um, based on, just to sum it up, based on your look at the work done by Dr. Edelman with this survey, your opinion is that it's a, a valid survey. Yes, basically it's what I would have done or what we would have done in our survey lab. Thank you. All right, and that's the end of the testimony. No cross there, but then we get to the arguments from each side, starting with the defense, where of course they're gonna start with the fact that there's tons of media coverage, it's all bad, but she also gets into, um, comparing the counties. I'm going to play this part here because I was like, oh, I take offense to this. She said, there are no media shows talking about how he's presumed innocent. And, you know, it's all he's guilty, 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 all bad, bad, bad. I was like, hey, Ann Taylor must not watch the show, right? She must not watch the show. But we're going to hear some of her um, argument here as to why the venue should change and why it should go from Leta to Ada specifically. And, and it's some really good arguments here. And then we're going to kind of talk through the states. I'm not going to play a lot of the states, but we're going to talk through the states as well. You heard a lot about that today. You heard how bias is created. And when you think about this little community and all of the people that spoke out early on about this case, 
That's how the bias starts in this case. People in this community have a lot of ownership in the case as well. They, they're connected to the case by being related to or knowing people that conducted the investigation. They're connected to the case by knowing the community leaders that have spoken out about the case. They're connected to the case by the relationship with the University of Idaho. That's a pretty tight connection. And that is, that is how you have to think about the human bias that exists and how it cannot be fixed if we get to jury selection. Your Honor has to look at the content and know the content of the media and know that there hasn't been positive stories about Brian Koberger. It's negative stories. There's not a media story talking about Brian Koberger's right to be presumed innocent. There's not a media story talking about Brian Koberger. Yes, there is. There's a media channel that talks about his right to be presumed innocent. Come on, Ann Taylor. Loved by his family. Nobody's talking about the good grades he achieved all through his undergraduate career and graduate programs. Nobody's talking about the dog that he loves and helps train. It's all negative. How many people know about that stuff, right? I mean, that, that's one of the problems as well, but I get what she's saying. It's false. It's misleading. It's stuff that's rumor and never coming in court. There are things about his character that are just untrue that are out there. When you have this much information surrounding the case, it's an extreme case and it's all over the place. I don't want the court to think all this social media happens and it's not centered in Laytock County. I think that's okay because it's just not. There's plenty that's centered in Laytock County. I'm sure the court remembers where we started earlier today with the two pie charts that uh, we were shown by Cruzco this morning. One talks about how big the coverage is in Laytock County that projects into Laytock County uh, compared to how small of a piece of the pie of the whole population in Idaho that Laytock County is. So that's a lot of coverage directed into Laytock County. And that's the stuff. Those are the, the uh, news stories, the nightly news that's coming into Laytock County residents' TVs. That's their newspaper that they're going to get in the morning. But that's not all. Laytock County has as much access to primetime news stories, as much access to Facebook groups, to different podcasts, to watch things on YouTube, to buy books containing this information. They have as much access to do that as anybody else. So you have to recognize how big the case is, how much coverage there is, and just how prejudicial the coverage is. You understand that, we understand that learning from, from Dr. L. Aliley this morning, when she talked about bias. So having that as a backdrop and thinking about the survey results that we just talked about, you can see that there is a huge correlation to the few media items that could be tested and prejudgment of guilt for Mr. Koberger. And those are people in Lintau County. You can see the case connections that are bigger than the other, the other counties, and they just don't go away. You also should be aware that the coverage doesn't drop off, it's not gonna stop, it may peak and it may dip a little bit. It comes right back up. You can expect that will continue. We have a pretty good schedule of hearings coming up for pretrial motions. The court issued a schedule in order a couple of months ago. And so you can expect that the interest in the case is going to pop back up every single time we have one of those hearings. And that's a lot of media coverage. And people in Lake County are going to see it and read it. And they're going to continue with their opinions. So what do we do? What do we do about it? It's tough. It's really tough in Idaho. There is a lot of case recognition and there's prejudgment in Idaho, but there's hope. When you look at the survey and you recognize that in other parts of this state, people don't recognize as many media items as they do in Lake Talk counties. That's good because that means right to prejudgment. So that's good. That's hope right there that we can find a jury somewhere in the state to give Mr. Koberger his right to a fair trial. They also, it's also a much larger population. So the impact on people sitting on the jury would be much smaller. Imagine with me that we are here in June of 2025 and we're here and we've seated 16 or so people over here. You're gonna recognize some of them. People that sit in the courtroom in our audience that wanna come and listen to the trial are going to see them. Even if they don't listen to the trial, people are gonna know who- But that happens in every case, locally speaking. So you can't possibly argue that you could never try a case locally where it happened. Cause that's how it is. I just had two people call me from a criminal trial that they sat. One of them got on the jury. One of them got close that they were like, yeah, we were talking cause the state attorney knew you, the judge knew you. I put down there that, you know, my husband works with you, you know, all this stuff. It's like, that's just how it is locally.
A lot of people know each other. That doesn't mean you can't have a trial there. I get it creates issues and you deal with those issues in voir dire, but it doesn't just automatically mean you can't have a trial there. And I think we've got to, we've got to make sure. Cause it's like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. We shouldn't know each other, but it's like, no, we want trials to happen locally where the crime occurs, the community that's affected. That is the rule changing venue is the very limited exception to that rule. And I'm not saying this case doesn't fit that exception. I'm just saying some of the overarching themes and arguments make it seem like every case should go somewhere else. Whose car leaves their driveway every morning to get to the courthouse by 830 for three solid months. And those jurors that sit over there are going to feel an immense amount of pressure to answer the call of the community to be safe. You bring, you can read those comments about what people in this community think about Mr. Koberger and what they think would happen if the jury found him innocent. It's hard to imagine that one of those jurors who all of a sudden said, you know what, I'm not sure, and listened to more evidence and said, I'm really not sure. I don't think he did it. Are they going to be brave enough to do that, to write not guilty, to say not guilty, and to stand their ground? That comes right to impartiality, that the court has to be sure that that's not going to happen. And you can't be sure that there's a way to pick an impartial jury in this community. In Ada County, we don't have that. We don't have that. Ken County, we also don't have that. Um, those are jurors that are not from this small, close-knit community. Those are jurors who aren't going to run into a police officer that investigated the case at a grocery store or maybe somebody from the prosecutor's office at the jazz festival at the college. There are people who don't have those connections. The other difference that I think is really important to think about, too, is that the the location, the connection to the house where this happened. That has been a pretty big deal in the community and wider, but in the community about whether the house should remain standing for trial or should be torn down. And there's been an awful lot of publicity about that. People in this community have an opinion one way or the other. We aren't going to know what their opinion is, but they're going to bring that into the court. Again, that happens in every case, but I do agree with what she's saying because of the high publicity and high profile nature, people want him to get convicted. And if he's not, there could be out backlash in their own community and jobs and families. I do understand that. People in Ada County do not have. And why Ada? Why not Canyon or why not Bannock? That's, I think that's something that we should talk about. The easiest one to talk about is Bannock. The, the numbers look a little better there in a lot of regards, but it's a smaller community as well. And so I think that there's a danger that if the court says, I'm going to change venue and we're going to Bannock County, I think there's a, a danger with that small community, there could be more interest all of a sudden and we may run, run into it. So this is why she's saying the bigger county is better. The small interest, it just becomes the big story and everybody cares about it. And then all of that's a, a problem in the small county, the new county that it goes to. That's why the bigger county will be better. And same reason the prosecutor makes the percentages arguments with a bigger uh, group of potential jurors, we can get a bigger percentage from a bigger population, which is even better. A bit of a problem. So that's that's why I'm not here telling you Bannock County, but if you tell us Bannock County, I think we have a lot better shot at seating an impartial jury than we do here in Latak. Canyon County is the second largest. And Your Honor, honestly, if the court says let's change venue, let's go to Canyon County or Bannock County, I think we have a better shot at getting... So she's like, we want Ada... But if you say one of those other counties, we're game. All of them are better than Latah County, which I thought was actually a good move by her to show there's not some reason we want Ada. It's not like we think we have some advantage in Ada County, but Latah County is a no-go. We'll take any other county, basically, is what she's saying, is what it sounds like to me, but specifically the ones that show in the survey that they are less biased, less prejudgment of guilt against Brian Cobra an impartial jury. But we picked Ada County specifically because we're aware of the, the structure of that courthouse, the way it's set up. We're aware that there's at least some statewide precedent for moving these big cases to Ada County. And we're aware that it would be easier to get our jurors to and from that courthouse in a way that they wouldn't have to go through the media. They would be kept private and in secret and secure. It makes sense to do to to focus on Ada County for a lot of those reasons. Yeah, you know, we are we are mindful that that's a lot of miles away from here. But and this is again part of the argument the state makes. At the end of the day, the interest that we have is to protect Brian Koberger's constitutional rights. 
His right to a fair trial is as important as our right to free speech, our right to bear arms, our right, right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, and the right to a fair trial cannot happen in Lake County. There is way too much media coverage. It is biased media coverage. It has impacted the potential juror and it causes bias in the potential juror. This is a tiny little community. And, this and the state says it's not that tiny. It's not that little. It's on the higher upper 25%. Um, and the state really makes a good argument about you can't throw out the whole system. Um, it's There's bad media attention everywhere. Rounding error, even the errors they talk about in the different communities. Get a bigger jury pool. Get 1,800 jurors from Latah County, and we solve a lot of these problems. I thought it was pretty good arguments. But but before we end the video, I do want to hear just a couple minutes of what the judge has to say at the end about his thoughts and when we can expect the decision and what he thinks about this decision specifically. Well, not going to give you a decision now. Number one, I would say this is probably professionally the most difficult decision I ever had to make. Um, professionally, the most difficult decision he's had to make. It's interesting, right? He's not a young guy. He's not an inexperienced judge. Both both sides, okay, have made, made really solid positions. I agree. And supported that. Um, I know there are a lot of considerations, practical, you know, in terms of logistics and prejudicial media. Um, so I have I have some work to do. I'm going to go through everything. Okay, even I thought I got most of everything, but um, that's going to take me a little bit of time, um, and uh, go through go through the law again, too, including the the rule itself and the interpretation of that. So um, I'll do my best. It's it's a challenge. So. That's probably all I should say at this point, but uh, I listened carefully all day and I thought uh, there, was, there was some really important things to think about, uh, both sides, and uh, that's what I'm going to do. So with that, I will adjourn and take care. Have a good rest. All right. So he's going to take some time and that's not really a surprise. A lot of judges do that in a lot of situations, but specifically here, I do feel like judge judges try to keep the ball rolling and try to keep it moving. This isn't something that delays the other work they're doing. It's not like a motion to compel discovery where if you don't turn over that discovery, it creates issues and pushes back depots. And now you make my job harder judge. If we're going to change venue later for trial, it doesn't necessarily, uh, make the case go faster for him to make the decision now. So he's going to take it under advisement, do some research, make the best and right decision, which I respect, appreciate, I'm glad he's going to do. Um, and so, so that's not a surprise as far as the delay, but what do I think he's going to do? Okay. I think there are really good arguments on both sides. So either way he comes down, I don't think it was a guaranteed, you know, this is going to be a super easy winning appellate argument for Koberger if the judge denies this motion, but I would lean on the side of granting it. Um, and the reason I think he's going to grant it is, my, the number one reason is the Daybell Vallow situation. High profile. We know it works well in Ada County. That's where they were moved to. Publicity was there. They were able to pick juries there. They were able to get to verdicts there. They were both convicted, but neither here nor there. Um, so it's been decided by another judge. And I think other cases have moved to Ada County in the past. So it may be an Idaho thing, but there's some precedent for it. I don't think it would be an overly... Um, controversial decision, which judges don't like to do. It would be kind of following suit, uh, not necessarily passing the buck, but not making some crazy decision. Uh, so I do think that's one of the main reasons. I also do think the media attention is there and we know it's bad. And if the defense is saying it'll be better in Ada County, fine. I don't know if it will be, but fine. Let's go ahead and try Ada County. It won't be the biggest news story. There'll be other stuff going on better than moving it to a small county and a better chance, a higher probability, anything's possible and there's no guarantees in life, but a higher probability of getting a less biased jury with less prejudgment of guilt, more likely to give Brian Koberger a fair trial. To me, I feel like there's enough pushing me in that direction, especially balancing the negative part, which is logistically it's difficult. 
more difficult for the witnesses, more difficult for the victims, which you don't want to do. But when balancing all that, I feel like it does tip in favor of moving it to Ada County. That's what I would guess, but I am not at all confident in that. Please let me know what you think is going to happen in the comment section. And I'll take a look at it later and kind of get the feel and the vibe of the community and what you guys think as well. Uh, make sure you guys hit the like button and subscribe to our page and let me know when anything comes next in this case that you want to talk about. But for now, that's all I got. Till next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, The Lawyer You Know.